Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Bible Class. <laughs> we are endeavoring to study through every chapter of the Bible, and we make PDF outlines for all of them. We are in 1 Kings chapter 11 today, which is like somewhere around a third of the way through the Bible, maybe a little bit further than that. So making some good progress, and let's talk about 1 Kings 11. 1 Kings 11 records events that happened in the middle to late years of King Solomon's reign over Judah and Israel. He reigned for 40 years from approximately 1015 to 975 BC, and here we're going to see time speed up quite a bit. The chapter moves through time quite quickly from the middle of Solomon's reign to his death at the end of the chapter. We have a host of characters to talk about, as the King James would say. First, Solomon, the third king of Israel and Judah, then a guy named Hadad, an enemy of Israel. He was an Edomite who lived in Egypt for many years. Got a guy named Rezin, who was an enemy of Solomon's. He was king in Damascus, and he reigned over Syria. Jeroboam, we're going to be introduced to him. He's going to play a quite significant role in the history of Israel and Judah, specifically Israel. He was an Ephraimite who was originally a servant of Solomon's, but he later became Solomon's enemy. God actually selected him to be the next king, uh, to be the king of Israel after Solomon's death. Just Israel, though, not Judah. We'll talk about that in our outline. And then Ahijah. Ahijah was a prophet of God who brought a message to Jeroboam. And then Rehoboam. Rehoboam was Solomon's son, and he was the fourth king over Israel and Judah for a very short period of time. He was primarily just king over Judah. Now, as far as our map, we've already mentioned several foreign nations in our character section, but really we're going to be focused on Jerusalem yet again. That's where most of these events are taking place. Solomon's house and the temple of the Lord were in Jerusalem. So in the last chapter, we talked a ton about Solomon's riches and how wise he was. Now, towards the end of the li his life, unfortunately, things are going to go south a little bit. Section number one, verses one through 13. Solomon's foreign wives turn his heart away from God. Solomon married many, and I mean many, foreign women. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites, Egyptians, and probably women from other nations. God's law, if you remember, actually forbid Israelites from marrying foreign women. Why? Because you just didn't like them? They look funny? No. <laughs> it was because foreign women were often idol worshippers. These foreign nations were pagans. They worshipped false gods. God didn't want that influence amongst his people. Solomon didn't listen. He didn't listen, like, a lot. He married 700 wives and had 300 concubines, and they turned his heart away from God. Solomon started honoring some of these pagan gods of his pagan wives, like Ashtaroth, Milcom, Chemosh, and Molech. If you know anything about the worship of those gods, you'll know there's some terrible things involved in that, things that God absolutely forbid. God told Solomon that because of this, he was going to take the kingdom away from his family and give it to another. However, for the sake of David, Solomon's father, he would allow Solomon's son to be the king over one tribe, but the rest would defect. That takes us to verses 14 through 25. God starts raising up some enemies against Solomon. God raised up enemies like a guy named Hadad, an Edomite. Uh, Hadad's backstory is recorded in verses 14 through 22. Hopefully you've already read that. The second enemy was a guy named Rezin. Rezin had previously served under one of David's enemies, Hadad Ezer of Zobah. So if God's going to take the kingdom away from Solomon's son, except one tribe, who's he going to give it to? Well, here in verses 26 through 40, we see God's selection of that man. God selects Jeroboam to lead Israel. Jeroboam was a manager of Solomon's uh, construction projects, and he's described as a very industrious man. One day, when he was walking out of Jerusalem, he was met by a prophet of God named Ahijah. Ahijah had this garment on, and he tore it into 12 pieces, and he told Jeroboam to take 10 of them. God was going to tear the kingdom of Israel out of the hand of Solomon's son, and he was going to make Jeroboam the king or the ruler over 10 of those 12 tribes. God promised that if Jeroboam would remain faithful to him, he would establish his household and he would bless his reign over these 10 tribes. Now Solomon, he found out about this. He tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt. Definitely getting some Saul vibes there from Solomon. 
God says, I'm going to take the kingdom from you because you've been disobedient. And then he tries to kill the guy that, that the Lord appoints to be the next king. Not moving in a good direction. Okay, finally, the death of Solomon in verses 41 through 43. Other details about the reign of Solomon are recorded in a book called the Book of the Acts of Solomon. That one's actually not in the Bible. Solomon died after reigning for 40 years. His son, Rehoboam, reigned in his place. And so unfortunately, you see Solomon's reign, which started off with so much promise, ending not so well. Again, kind of like the reign of Saul. So we see Israel and Judah kind of moving in the wrong direction. You know, they were moving in the right direction under David. Solomon kind of reverts back to what came before David. But anyway, let's talk about our application as we finish up. Really simple application today. Followers of God need to marry followers of God. <laughs> That's not profound or deep, but I think it's it's incredibly important, especially in today's climate. It's likely that no one in the world is going to impact your soul as much as your spouse is going to. And as Solomon shows us, choosing the wrong woman or women in Solomon's case can have devastating consequences on you and those in your sphere of influence, like your children, for example. And the same is true for a woman who marries the wrong man. I know that it can be hard to find somebody, to find a believer who you want to marry. It's easy to go out into the world. There's a lot more variety out there, a lot more people out there. But we absolutely have to make it a priority for Christians to marry Christians. How are you going to live this life in union with somebody who doesn't share your worldview, who doesn't respect the creator of the universe, and who doesn't share your values, both in your shared lives and in potentially the lives of your children, if God blesses you with those.